This is a photograph uh, of me outside the house I grew up in, in Grig Avenue. Um, it marks my credentials. When I first started signing books in pont pret one lady actually waited for half an hour to reach my table, and only to say, I don't want a book, but I can't place you, and I grew up on the Grig, and there are no colliers in your street. And when I told her that my name was Jones, my father was Glyn Jones, I gave her my aunt's and my grandmother's name, she said, I know who you are now, and she walked off quite happily. So this photograph is my credentials, probably taken about 1955, somewhere around there, outside the house where I grew up. We move on to the next one. Sorry. Yeah, I wish that uh, we'd been taught a lot more Welsh history in my schools. I went to Massacoid and I went to the girls' grammar school and I knew very, very little about the history of Pontypri, the history of Wales. We always seem to be concentrating on English history and it would have made sense looking at all the pits around us if we'd even known we were on a coal field. Uh, I love this photograph because pits were just sunk everywhere. And when you think of that poor woman in the house behind trying to do a weekly shop with all that coal coming up, uh, all her washing and everything is just absolutely incredible. Uh, it, the pit was called Dan's Muck Hole. It was in Pogwine, apparently. Move on to the next one. This is a lovely print of the old bridge and the church behind it which is now the museum. I really like it because if you look in the distance at the buildings you've got the boys grammar school there and you've got later on Coydalan and the others. They are good solid buildings that are built by a confident industrial town and it really gives me I think some idea of where Pontypri came from. And the next one Right, the depression really hits Wales badly. And I think to put it in very simplistic terms, in the 19th century, there was a new breed of Victorian engineer. They built the industry, they sank the pits, they built the uh, ironworks. And generally speaking, they worked alongside the men. As they died off, so the conglomerates moved in, bought their industries, bought the pits, and that's when the trouble started because they started to cut wages. And the first inkling of this in the Rondo was the 1910-1911 strike. And reading the newspapers, which is all I had to go on when I wrote the Beggars and Choosers, Winners and Losers series about the Tonopandi riots, um, I honestly think that the government of the day really thought that the Russian Revolution had broken out in Tonopandi seven years before Russia. They were absolutely terrified with what was going on. The miners had formed a union. They wanted uh, a basic wage that would have given people enough to live on. When they went out on strike, the union paid strike pay of 10 shillings a week. But they also organized the opening up of drift mines and miners went in and dug coal for fuel and to cook meals for their families. Um, this is a photograph of one of the 1910 drift mines. Move on to the next one, please. And they tried to make uh, light of life wherever they could. This is one of the strike distress parades. And if you look at the very much homemade costumes there, you can pick out a Charlie Chaplin. I think there's one in the corner here. And there's um, a little titch here somewhere. Uh, but my father, he was born in 1920. He actually remembered the 26th strike. And all he can remember is the fun they had because the miners were home and they were able to play with the kids. So from that point of view, really good close-knit community that went through everything together. And the next ones, please. Uh, that's a hunger march from the Ronda down into pont And after that, I've got, um, yeah, the First World War broke out. Things got slightly better. Coal was in demand. 
some of the pits opened up again. And this is actually a munition worker's funeral procession. She worked in a munition factory in Burryport. Um, there was what uh, I came to come across quite often. It was a minor incident in a munitions factory. If you saw that in the newspaper, you know that more than one person had died. That particular instance in 1917, two young girls died. When um, they organized the funeral, they had a sort of military style funeral with fellow workers walking alongside it. That's actually taken in High Street in Swansea. Next one, please. And now we come to the hunger marches of the 20s and the 30s. Not just miners, but iron workers, cotton workers, mill workers from all over the country. And this really came home to me when I went on holiday to Newquay when I was about 11 or 12. And the lady um, who I stayed with told me that the whole village turned out when they heard Welsh miners singing coming in. Uh, they had walked all the way from the Rhonda and they were just going everywhere, trying to spread the message that they wanted fair wages for a fair day's work. I thought that was really moving that she remembered it after so many years. Uh, there's another photograph of another hunger march in September 33. Uh, onto the next photograph, which is one from my grandmother's um, collection. The Prince of Wales spoke very eloquently about the poverty in the Rhonda. He apparently, uh, during the First World War, he went into the trenches, never near, too near the front line, but he met some Welsh guardsmen who told him about life in the Rhonda, and he certainly came back to the Rhonda at the end of the war and visited quite often. And he wrote very movingly about the poverty in the Rhonda and how dreadful it was that a miner's wife was only afford, able to afford to buy one cloak, which she had to share with her five daughters. Um, there was quite a movement, I think, after the First World War, uh, particularly among the middle classes in England, who were going to re-educate the Welsh in proper nu nutrition and housewives' duties and that sort of thing. And one woman just threw her hands up in despair. She was um, a cookery expert, if you like. She'd come down to, the, uh, to Wales and she'd taken a look at minor snack boxes and was horrified to see two slices of bread and a homegrown beetroot in one. And when she talked to the miner and his wife and discovered what they were earning, she just decided that she couldn't do anything to help. The reason I've got this photograph is not because the Prince of Wales knew anybody in the family, but if you look at the gentleman on the left who's got a mayor's chain, behind him is a Red Cross nurse who is doing duty at the rugby or football match, I'm not sure which it is. That is my grandmother. Next photograph, please. Yeah, Ponty's 40 Thieves. Um, the people who lived in Pontypridd and Rhonda, the miners' wives, who were finding it such a struggle to make ends meet, they would have loved to have dressed like this. And this is a generic photograph that was not taken in Pontypridd um, because I want to preserve the anonymity of the people who helped with my research. There were several women, I don't know how many in total, they were spread around Pontypridd, the Greig, Trehavard, Tracklund, right throughout the area. Some of them covered up their clandestine activities by acting as agents for stores like Leslie or even Gwilym Evans, where you could buy a dress and pay it off at the rate of a penny a week for, in the pound for however many weeks until the debt was cleared. Now, these women carried it a little bit further because apparently they could go into stores like William Evans and Howells in Cardiff and they were reputed to be able to get any dress off a model in a window or in the store itself. And uh, they became quite famous. And fortunately, the police uh, discovered some of the activities and they carried out a series of raids. 
And I talked to some eyewitnesses who'd lived on the Grig at that time. And they said that the police had come in from both ends of a street of terrace houses. And they went through house by house searching for shoplifted goods. Some of the women in the middle realized what was going on and sent their children over the garden walls to warn people that the police were searching. Um, this particular lady that I was talking to, her aunt was apparently one of the ringleaders. She sent her children upstairs to get all her stolen goods. She put them all in her wash boiler and started stirring it. And um, when the police came in, they searched the house, they found absolutely nothing and they left and she got off scot-free. If they'd looked in the wash boiler, they would have been handbags, shoes, hats, all sorts in there. Uh, I actually used that story in Hearts of Gold, but I gave it a slightly different uh, ending. You go on to the next slide. Uh, again, this is taken from a London newspaper. This is not the Pontypris ones. I've, I read the accounts and I know the names of the people involved and I'm, I really respect their anonymity. It happened a very long time ago. But several of the ladies who were involved in that were sentenced to 10 years hard labor, which I think given the, their family circumstances and the fact that they did it just to put food on the table was more than a little bit harsh. Uh, next one, please. Uh, this is my grandmother. She. This is taken about 1917, 1918, when she was in training as a nurse. Next one, please. Her walking out costume. Next one, please. Um, and this was taken when she started working in the workhouse after 1926 in Pontypridd. Uh, next one, please. This is her father. Uh, his name is David John. He was killed in a pit accident when he was 33. Next one, please. And I managed to find his grave, which the family uh, had lost for several years in Triallo Cemetery. And when he died, he left four children under 10. My grandmother was the oldest. The youngest was a couple of months old. Um, I have no idea what pit he worked in. I've been looking to try and find some record of it, but uh, several people have told me if, if it less than five people had died in a pit accident, they were very rarely even recorded. Uh, next one, please. Uh, these are my, gran uh, my grandmother's two younger brothers, uh, Hayden and Eddie. If anybody's read Hearts Gold, I recycled the names. Uh, Hayden, uh, who's the one who's sitting down, was actually 14, maybe 15 at the time. Like Eddie, who was 16, maybe 17. Both of them lied about their age and joined up in the First World War. Both of them survived. Unfortunately, Hayden was gassed. Um, and this had a lasting effect on his health. And he suffered from bouts of amnesia. He couldn't remember his name. He would disappear from the Ronda. They would find him singing in Bristol streets or London or Cardiff. And they'd bring him back home, but it would only really be a matter of time before he'd wander off again. And uh, unfortunately he died at 33, the same age as his father died. Next one, please. And that's a last photograph that was taken of him just before he died. Next one, please. And my grandmother's younger sister, who was very glamorous, and her name was Maud. And yes, she did die of TB, but uh, quite late in life. I think she was in her 40s when she died. Next one, please. And this is um, my grandmother's, my great grandmother's brother, John Joseph Bull, who apparently was a hellfire and damnation preacher in the Rhonda and liked nothing better than to uh, preach to minors if he caught them drinking on a Saturday night. I'm sure he was not an entirely popular figure. Um, but again, I'd heard so many stories about him. It was just uh, too good not to uh, put in the book. Next one, please. And this is his wife, Elizabeth. Uh, what's interesting is this photograph was taken about the 1930s and she's dressed uh, in Edwardian clothes. 
a lot of women as they age, particularly in Wales, they didn't follow fashion at all. They just stuck to the fashion of their youth. And it makes it very difficult to actually pinpoint the age of some old photographs. If anybody is trying to look at family photographs, you can safely say that in Wales, uh, fashions were definitely 10 years behind London. Next one, please. Uh, yeah, this is a photograph uh, of a painting by Ted Walkie. I've got a quite a stack of Ted Walkie's paintings in it's of the wonderful Art Deco facade of the original Pontypris train station. The reason I put it in is um, my grandmother, the nurse, had an illegitimate child and her family really felt there was just an appalling uh, slur on the entire family and a disgrace. And they paid a minor to marry her, not the father of the child. And unfortunately, it turned out to be a very unhappy marriage. And she was a victim of domestic abuse. And when my father was six years old and his sister was eight, she ended up in hospital with what the family uh, tried to say was meningitis. It wasn't actually her husband had fractured her skull. When she left the hospital, she moved all of seven miles from Tonopandi down to Pontypridd and passed herself off as a widow. And as a widow, she was able to find work. And I really admire her because at that time, that era, 1926, to walk away from your family was quite something. Next picture, please. And that's Ted Walkie's painting uh, of the inside of the train station as it was in the 1930s. Uh, what I love about Ted Walkie's paintings is there's very often a lady in yellow that is actually his wife. Um, her best clothes were yellow and he used to put her in several of his paintings. And as for the little girl hanging upside down and showing her knickers, that's the sort of thing I can remember doing <laughs> at that age. Next one, please. And this is Ted Walkie's painting of the workhouse where my grandmother worked from 1926 uh, up until about 1944, just before the end of the war. I really like the way he's sort of captured a glimpse of life in the workhouse. He's, a lot of his paintings have also got a grammar school, uh, a girl in grammar school uniform outside it. Apparently his first girlfriend went to the grammar school. So he puts her in a lot of his paintings as well. But you've got the nurses there, you've got a porter manning the lodge where all the staff signed in and out. That was the main entrance to the hospital and that's where the staff went in. If you went in as an inmate, you generally went through very high gates uh, at the side of Mantwick Road. If we go on to the next one, we've actually got a photograph, the only photograph anybody in Pontypridd had of the front of the workhouse. Um, this is why I really wish that someone had had the temerity to go around these buildings and photograph them before they were destroyed. I've been around other workhouses like Abergavenny Workhouse and it's easier there to picture what life was like. This photograph we know was taken in 1935 because it's got bunting up for the King's Jubilee. It was sent to me very kindly by Brian Davis of Pontypridd Museum. And it was found apparently at the back of a filing cabinet uh, owned by one of the Pontypridd solicitors. We go on to the next one, please. This is the staff in 1939 in the workhouse. Um, not as many as you'd expect because the workhouse inmates would be doing some of the work. Uh, in the middle row, third from the right is my grandmother. Sitting in the front, you've got the workhouse master and the matron of the infirmary. Next to the matron, you've got the chairman of the parish garden uh, guardians. As I said, if anybody recognizes anybody in their family or they want to copy this photograph, please feel free. Next one, please. And this was on the front page of the Pontypridd Observer in December, 1939, entitled Christmas Day in the Workhouse. And underneath was a list of all the food that the workhouse inmates were going to get. Every man was going to get uh, an ounce of tobacco and every woman was going to get uh, an orange, an apple and some nuts. My grandmother is on the left, second from the left in the back. 
Along with the article, there was a list of all the councillors and dignitaries of the town who were going into the workhouse to serve the inmates lunch. It wasn't just a workhouse when my grandmother was there in the 30s. There was also um, an infirmary there and a hospital. And if you were taken into the hospital or the infirmary, you were expected to pay for your care. Uh, there was no free NHS in those days. And it really used to annoy my mother whenever I told anybody I was born in the workhouse. I was born in Pontypridd Workhouse, but I was born there in 48 before the NHS came in. And she took great delight in telling everybody that she had to pay to have me. Next photograph, please. Uh, this was sent to me um, by someone when I started to do my research. It shows how they were pulling down and demolishing the old workhouse while they were building the new uh, Dewey Sand Hospital on the same site. It must have been absolute chaos. I can't imagine how they did it. Uh, if you look at the next photograph, you have Dewey Sand, the modern hospital and the workhouse above it. The workhouse was an incredibly expensive building when it was built. It cost over £7,000. And I remember going in there and I can remember seeing fantastic tiles, mahogany stair rails, um, tiled walls, tiled floors. And as an example of Victorian architecture, it really was quite something. I we go on to the next one. One of the best things about being a writer is receiving emails and letters from readers. And this was sent to me by a lady who was trying to trace her grandmother. Um, she thought this is a photograph of the workhouse staff in the 1930s, it's not. I placed it about 1917, 18, because the two gentlemen at the back with hats on um, are probably dressed in the uniform of convalescent soldiers who were wounded in the First World War. Uh, again, the long skirts of the nurses give it away, so I put it more at that. If you go on to the next photograph, and I'm sorry, it's not very good quality. These two girls are 12 years old and they're unmarried mothers. Um, they had the babies. Their family obviously felt it was a disgrace. They were put in the workhouse because they were pregnant. Um, they were allowed to keep their children for the first six weeks. After six weeks, I quote, if they were good, and I mean the mothers, they could see their children for one hour on a Sunday. Um, both of these girls were found domestic, work as domestics in London, and both of them were sent up to London to take up their positions. The lady who sent me the photograph said that her, well, it would have been her great-grandmother, actually managed to persuade her great-grandfather to allow her to go and claim her daughter's child and bring it home, and they brought him up. Unfortunately, he never saw his mother again. She was trying to trace her mother, find out what happened to uh, her father's mother, what happened to her. Uh, as far as I know, she never did. I wish I could have helped her, but if anybody is trying to trace any of the illegitimate births that happened in the Greg workhouse, most of the private records are locked and for very good reason and they are just left there. But there are other ways of checking records. If you go on to the next one. Um, yeah, when I was doing research, that what it was down to is uh, persuading people to draw me maps of what the buildings were. This is actually drawn by Councillor Des Wood, who worked in the, the workhouse at one time, but at least they gave me some idea of the layout of the buildings. Next one, please. Uh, and the next one again, St. John's Parish Magazine. If you look down at the bottom at the baptisms, there is a whole pile of baptisms from the central homes. And the vicar of the Greig would actually uh, ask people to bring some of the illegitimate children um, to St. John's Church and he would have a mass baptism. You can also see that there you've got a Trevor Flewellyn who was a seaman. So it wasn't just children that were baptised in St John's Church. It was also uh, people who were on the tramp and lost jobs. 
uh, in the workhouse for all sorts of reasons. Perhaps they were ill, destitute, any sort of reason. Perhaps they'd had a breakdown. Uh, but when talking about the workhouse, yes, uh, I agree. They were not very nice places to go to. But the only alternatives for an awful lot of people was to live on the streets. And it was a choice between a roof over your head, three meals a day and a bed at night or living in the gutter. And for some people, they just went into the workhouse. And yes, they could have been better places, but my father, uh, who often walked his mother up and down the Greig Hill when she was working there, particularly when she was on the night shift, uh, quite often he remembered taking the, the family a radio down there when my grandmother was put in charge of the unmarried ward. That the staff were as sympathetic as they possibly could be. I'm not saying it was nice. What I'm saying is people did try to help other people. Uh, next one, please. Yeah, now we come on to the war. Uh, there's quite a lot of stories about the evacuees who came in from London. If you look at the Pontypridd Observer, there are full of letters of complaint from Welsh housewives who are complaining that London children could, didn't behave properly. They didn't know how to use a knife and fork. Uh, they were used to coming in and grabbing a sandwich and going back out in the streets to play. And if you look at those children, they look absolutely terrified as well they might. I talked to quite a few evacuees and one of my friends in Swansea, um, who was the son of a Jewish barrow boy from the East End, he was sent to Swansea and really landed on his feet. He ended up in living in a mansion run by servants and staff. And when his father came to pick him up after five years, uh, it was really sad. He discovered that he had nothing in common with him. And the people who owned the mansion wanted to keep him on. And to him, he just stayed where he was. So it, it was a, a time of, of great social upheaval. Go on to the next one, please. Um, can you imagine London children coming from networks of dark streets in the East End and suddenly finding mountains on their doorstep and collieries? Next one, please. Food rationing. Uh, this was a period in Pontypridd when the park was dug up and they grew vegetables and potatoes and virtually every square inch of land was used to grow food. Next one. Um, this is one of the horrible things that happened during the war. Uh, the roundup of all the Italians in Pontypridd and the Ronda, some of them were put on the Arandora Star, which was sunk. Um, some of the ones who survived the sinking of the Ar Arandora Star were literally fished out of the sea, put on another boat and sent to Australia. And I've actually got... Um, something here that I wrote when I researched this for my book of One Blue Moon. 49 men born, born in and around Bardi and the Ceno Valley in Italy, the area from which a majority of Welsh cafe owners came, died on the Arundora Star. Nearly all of them were arrested in Wales no one who knew them would believe for an instant that they were fascist sympathizers. Most had sons and brothers fighting in the British army or with the Italian resistance. The Italian home of at least one man was marked as a safe haven on a map without his permission or knowledge given to RAF personnel prior to flying missions over Italy. Um, a wonderful man called Romeo Bassini helped me enormously with the research for One Blue Moon, which is about the Italian uh, community in Wales. And later on, I wrote about what happened during the war. And Romeo was fantastic because in 1939, the summer of 39, his parents decided he and his sister looked a bit peaky. So they sent him to Italy to spend the summer with his grandparents. Of course, something happened in 1939. And they had to wait until 1945 to reclaim Romeo and his sister. But from my point of view, it was fantastic because he could tell me what war was like in Italy as well as war in Pontypridd. 
Uh, if anybody wants a copy of this photograph, I think that what I'll probably do is end up putting it up on my Facebook page. It's actually taken from a copy of the Western Mail. Next one, please. Yeah, after Dunkirk, uh, the government was doing all sorts to try and uh, boost people's spirits. And this is a tank parade in Swansea where they were rattling tins for people to donate money to build more tanks. Next one, please. Uh, everybody was volunteering. This is Kilburnhead Red Cross. Um, top line, fourth from the left is my grandmother. And she was uh, really proud of being a member of the Red Cross and she actually had a gold medal, which one of my cousins had. And uh, it's fantastic to see everybody trying to do their bit. Uh, next one, please. Home Guard in Pontypridd. Um, there's somebody, one gentleman there, uh, who obviously has some military training. Next one. And yeah, the younger Home Guard, uh, who obviously thought war was a lot of fun. Next one. Yep, here they come. Overpaid, oversexed, and over here. And Pontypridd had two regiments both South Carolina regiments, one black, one white, and that made for a great deal of trouble, which I'll go on to in a moment. Next one, these are the white GIs, and the next one, and the black GIs. Uh, apparently, there were a lot of fights in the pubs in pont because the white GIs, particularly the, um, the MPs, trying to enforce the same colour bar in pont as existed in the Carolinas. And the miners weren't having any. If there was a fight between white and black GIs, the miners always going in on the side of the black GIs. And my father said when he came home on leave a couple of times, uh, it was quite hair raising. Um, in the end, I think there was sort of an official agreement that the white GIs would go to one pub and the black GIs would go to another. But it really did create a lot of problems at the time. Next one, please. And um, this is rather a nice letter that was in the Pontypridd Observer in 1945. And I read a small extract of it. Again, this is something that I will probably end up putting on my Facebook page. It's from uh, a black sergeant in Germany, and he wrote to the editor of the newspaper, I fell in love with your valley and can truthfully say that it is best of all towns and cities that I have been to since joining the army. There were times when I said to myself and others, I would much rather live there in pont in brackets, True Forest, and many other towns rather than live in some parts of the US. There is one problem that your people do not even take notice of, and that is prejudice and racial discrimination. I have been to a great many cities and towns in the US where racial discrimination is dominant and also prejudice. While in Wales, nothing of this sort happened to me or any of the other members of the unit. This was truly a new experience to us, and we certainly did love it. We danced with your young ladies, talked with them, and some of them we even made love to. They taught us your simple and divine ways of living, and also your lovely songs. All of this made us feel as though Pontypridd was home. If you go on to the next one, please. Unfortunately, um, there was quite a few mixed race children born. And the fact that the parents didn't marry is not the fault of the parents. Uh, I actually talked to grandfathers who did all they could to try and find out what happened to the children and what happened to men that they regarded as future son-in-laws. If um, a black GI applied for permission to marry a white girl, he was invariably sent to the north of Scotland, uh, somewhere near Inverness, I believe. And any letters that were given by the, the girl 
or the girl's family were not forwarded to him. Uh, there have been quite a few stories in the press lately about black GIs who tried to contact the, the white girls they were going out with. They knew that she was pregnant and they never found one another. As for the children, quite a few of them, possibly not so much in Pontypridd, but certainly in other areas, these children were taken and put into orphanages. The Americans did not want them and they really thought that they were doing the best for the children. It's certainly another tragedy of the war, which is absolutely horrendous. Right, if you go on to the next one, please. Munition factories. Uh, my father insisted that during the war, uh, Clark Gable, Robert Donat, and David Niven, and Stuart Granger, I believe, um, were all in Pontypridd, and they were all selling kisses for war bonds. I was never quite sure whether to believe him until when I was doing my research, sure enough, there was a picture of them coming out of the Park Hotel, going down to the Trafalgar Estate to sell kisses for war bonds. So yes, it did go on. Uh, not Stuart Granger, Jimmy Stewart. I always keep on mixing those two up. Um, again, occasionally in the Pontypridd Observer, you'll find a story about a minor incident. Um, you knew that that minor incident would have cost somebody's life. There would have been an explosion in the munitions factory. Go on to the next one, please. Yeah, that's an explosion in a munition factory. And uh, there were a horrendous number of deaths. But again, it wouldn't have been a uh, circumstance to actually put up the figures in the paper. So it's impossible for us after this length of time to actually find out what happened and how many people did die. Pontypridd Town Hall. Um, I absolutely loved going there as a child. I remember going to live shows and I can remember going when it became a cinema later on. If you go on to the next photograph, this is where the town hall was in, but it still is. Uh, the top two floors are actually the theatre. If you go through the door and you look on your right, you will actually see a door that leads to the old stage door of the town hall. Next one, please. And this is a Ted Walkie painting of the town hall, the theatre of his youth and how much he liked it. Again, you've got some girl in grand school uniform there again. Uh, next one, please. I became very friendly with uh, some of the artists who did the jackets for some of the Hearts of Gold books. They've had more jackets, I think, than I have dresses hanging in the wardrobes. Um, this was for All the Glitters, which was about theatre life between the wars. And he painted the part of the town hall behind the central character there. Next one, please. Town Hall had quite a history during the war. Uh, this is Oswald Mosley, and he hired the town hall and decided to hold a, a black shirt meeting there. Um, he was an ardent fascist, as everybody knows. He really made a mistake when it came to Pontypridd. The miners turned up, and from what I can gather, there was practically a pitched battle inside the town hall. There were injuries on both sides and some of the miners were actually arrested and charged with grievous bodily harm. If you go on to the next one, this was repeated throughout the Ronda as well. In the end, Oswald Mosley gave up trying to bring his particular brand of fascism to the Welsh Valleys and stuck to London. Next one, please. Uh, this is from an old boxing program. Uh, boxing is something that's sort of like singing. It runs through the valleys and they used to have huge matches here. But at least it gives some of the people who haven't, uh, haven't gone into the town hall an idea of what it was like. If you go into the next one. These photographs, um, I know who made them. I won't credit them because it's pretty obvious that they broke into the town hall and took the photographs late 
at night when they shouldn't have. But it is a record of what the town hall looks like now. And I have been round there. Um, I was given a guided tour by somebody from the market company when I asked if I could go in. Next one, please. That's the projection room. Next one, please. And as you see, it's in a pretty dismal state. There is asbestos in the building and it is dangerous. I wish we had the money to do something about it. And unfortunately, this one has gone the same way. Uh, it was one of the first music halls um, to be open in the Ronda. And the cinema was one of the first great Art Deco cinemas in Pontypridd. Go on to the next one. Somebody has made a record of what it was like. So at least we have some photographs, which is more than we have from the inside of the workhouse. And the next one is a couple of what the county cinema was like. New Inn Hotel, uh, I remember it. I absolutely loved it. it. The first New Inn was built somewhere in round about the 1750s, 1760s, I believe. Beautiful building, beautiful staircase. Next one. And this is a photograph of the staircase. It doesn't really do justice to it, but you've got some idea of what the stained glass was like and the scale of the place. It was just incredible. Um, as a small child, going to the League of Pity and Dr. Bernardo's dances, it was incredible. Really felt like I was posh going up those stairs. Next one. And this is Ted Walkie's take on the New Inn Hotel. Uh, as a girl in the grammar school, there was a ladies only bar at the side and we often used to sneak in there for a, a quick drink. I mean, we were 18 in the sixth form. Um, quite often we'd go in there and find some of the teachers drinking, <laughs> which I'm not sure they appreciated. But yeah, it was a, a building that dominated the town. Next one. And this is where it was, the corner of Market Square. And I can't believe that they pulled it down to put uh, Smiths and a couple of other shops there. It just didn't make sense to me at all. Uh, there are rumors that the building is haunted. When I did some signing sessions in Smiths, I talked to some of the staff who told me about very odd goings on there. Uh, but as one of them said, it must be a very sad, existence in the afterlife if all you can do is haunt Smiths and throw some of the baskets around the floor. Next one please. Yeah this again is one of Gordon Crabbe's jackets for uh, my books and because I was able to collaborate with him even though it gave rise to emails the author is getting too friendly with the artist. Uh, I got him to put Charlie's Pie Shop in there and I was quite surprised at one of the um, talking to someone who had read the book and he said that's very clever of you because that pie shop closed in 25 and I said I never knew there was a pie shop there I thought it was a toy shop but anyway that's where I put Charlie's pie shop and he actually it exists on the jacket if it exists nowhere else. Next one please. The boom years of Pontypridd. Next one. Uh, the BBC made a film of Hard to Go, probably the least said about that, the better. I remember having a terrible argument with um, the producer uh, when he said that he was going to put a pit strike in it. And I said the whole point of Hard to Go was uh, the emphasis should be on the 40 Thieves and not on the pit strike because the pits were closed and you can't have a strike if the pits are closed. And he said, we know it didn't happen, but it might have. And at that point, I sort of walked away from it. Kate Jarman did a superb job of playing Bethan and I've worked on, with, on her, with her on projects since. Going to the next one. Uh, it's Jeremy Sheffield and Kate Jarman in one of the scenes. Um, one of the old cars and that's some of the publicity material that came out for it. Uh, it was shown on BBC Worldwide Television in 2003. It's been shown eight times in Australia. Um, the BBC will not show it again. I don't know why. Uh, I know people have written and asked if they are going to show it again, but the answer usually comes back no. Next one, please. 
and nothing to do with me, honestly. <laughs> Next one, the sunken garden. Um, I think it's nice that people are reminded now and again that the park is the Angus and Harrod War Memorial Park and the sunken garden was meant as the heart of it. And it was somewhere where widows, and you can see Ted Walk here, as painted women in black could go and remember their husbands because they had no grave for them and uh, or they were buried in France or they had no grave at all. Uh, next one please. And you can see Ted Walkie's love for Pontypridd in these paintings uh, which is one of the reasons I've collected so many of them. Next one please. My second home in Pontypridd, the library, we are really lucky to have the staff that we've had over the years in Pontypridd. I doubt very much if I would have become a writer without the encouragement I received from people in that building and the help I've received more recently with research. Next one, please. Uh, yeah, there's a whole pile of um, pictures now that I use in my research. I really go into detail. I use ordnance survey maps. I walk along the routes that my characters walk. Next one, please. Uh, if there's buildings missing, I look for photographs where, that I can use to sort of imagine what they look like. This is an old building uh, on in Penkoika, uh, which became 40 Towers nightclub at one time. And I used it to house my characters in. Um, it's a foible. Not all writers work the same way. And I do have to know where my characters live and I have to know uh, what they eat and where they go and where they work. Next one, please. A couple more. You can flip through these. Um, then this is a souvenir boxing program. Boxing was absolutely huge in Montreux. And if you keep flipping through these, there's a lot of photographs uh, lifted from the program of, please go on to the next one. Uh, they formed a committee to raise money for um, an operating theater and an x-ray room for the cottage hospital. Clara Thomas, whose family uh, donated the ground that Gethy Wasted Church stands on, St. Catherine's, and £7,000 to build it. They donated a fair slice of the money for the cottage hospital because she thought that minors should have somewhere better than the workhouse to go if they were ill. And they, she also donated £500 towards the operating theatre and the x-ray room. We'll go on to the next one. And those are the new operating theatre and x-ray room, which would have been uh, absolutely the height of fashion in 1931. <laughs> Next one. We seem to have lost your picture, Karen. Um, I don't know, we can still hear you. Um, so that's the most important thing, but for some reason, it's just the screen's gone off, so I can't see a picture. Ah, well, we'll have a look when we've gone to the end. We? Yeah, that's fine, that's <laughs> no problem. <laughs> we'll keep going. <laughs> You're not missing much, I assure you. Yes. <laughs> if anybody wants any of these photographs, just let me know and I'll put them up on Facebook and then you can lift them from there. And if you go on to the next one. Oh, we can see you again. You've come back. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah, I remember the Gales, Walter Gale and Jack Gale were very instrumental, apparently, in raising money for charity in Pontypridd. <laughs> next one. And that's a committee that raised money. Is so that boxing and singing uh, really resonates in the town. And that's why I had a boxer and a singer in the book. Next one, the Moody's. Um, they were actually from the Grieg and I met their sister at a talk in Newport. And she knew that I'd mentioned the, the Moody brothers in one of my books. And it was lovely sitting and having a coffee with her. and sort of reliving, if you like, the 50s and the success they'd had. Next one. Yeah, you can flick through these quickly. These are just adverts. Um, if my characters catch buses, they pay the right fare, they go on the same route. And St. Catherine's Cafe, um, just adverts. 
Uh, this is an old photograph that Andrew Coslett uh, has painted and turned into um, greetings cards. I bought quite a few of his cards in Pontypridd Museum. And we're really lucky in Pontypridd. We have so many talented artists and uh, actors and all sorts. Next one. Yeah, it's another one of Andrew Coslett's paintings. And this is the old bridge. I thought that the crown was there uh, to celebrate the coronation, but apparently not. It was something to do with the trams. Um, don't ask me for an explanation. I don't understand it at all. And the next one. Yeah, these are my adverts. Uh, any information on any of my films or books or projects I'm working on, you'll find on my website, katrincollierco.uk. Next one. And I'm working on conjunction with it with a, a film company and it's early stages of development, but Julian Lewis Jones has very kindly agreed to be our Glyndwr. The first two books are out. I'm working on the third, which is Glyndwr, Our Child's Child to Weep. And there will be a fourth one. I'm hoping one will come out this autumn and one next year. 